Well, good morning, and welcome to another episode of Ledger Legends, where numbers come to life. This morning, we have our guest, Paul Livingston, with us uh, with My Medicare Help Center. Uh, Paul's here today to discuss uh, some options um, and the different nuances of health insurance within our small business community, and, and how, do we, how do we optimize that? How do we make that available to, to more clients, uh, more individuals? So, uh, welcome, Paul. Thanks. Please take a minute and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, my name's Paul Livingston. Um, I live in Springdale. I'm married for almost 49 years. Woo-hoo! I've got two children that live here, five grandkids. And <gasps> so, my, um, my professional background started out uh, in 1977 as a registered nurse. So, I spent about 40 years on the healthcare provider side of things, okay. doing a variety of of different roles, bedside nursing, flight nurse, ran a acute inpatient rehab unit, um, had a nurse staffing agency uh, at one point in time. So just uh, worked in a lot of types of environments, everything except for maybe OB-GYN and uh, psych and okay. pediatrics. Oh, so, well, that's yeah, all right. I think you right. went inside. They wouldn't let me work in ob for some reason. <laughs> I could never could figure that out. I don't know what that was. You know, could have been. I don't know what it was. Now, your wife's part of your team She is. Now. My wife is now. My wife's a registered nurse all, also, and she uh, um, her background is really – most of her career is spent in psych nursing, so she uses all of her psych nursing skills on me every day, which one of your 31 personalities am I dealing with today? And she's quite effective, and uh, you can see the finished product here. I'm <laughs> somewhat tame today, so <laughs> there we go. But I uh, uh, started um, in, in 2017, left the provider side, and then felt like that I wanted to um, – you know, we saw a lot of people come into uh, our healthcare facilities, and they didn't understand their health insurance um, coverage. Their kids didn't un- understand their health insurance coverage, and so when I left the provider side, I felt like that that would be a fun thing for me to do as my last career. So, it's one at a time, or multiples at a time, I'm trying to do uh, Medicare education and health health insurance education for our, our seniors. So. And that's I'm, huge. Yeah, yeah, it it, it mm-hmm. is. It's it is uh, it is confusing. And I'll just say, I tell a lot of people. I said, you know, I went, I spent a lot of years in healthcare, went through a lot of training. But I will tell you accurately that healthcare providers get no training about health insurance or or Medicare. So if you're trying to get advice from a physician or a nurse or somebody in the business office at a clinic or a hospital about Medicare, you are going to the wrong place. It's not their fault. That's not what they do. That's not what they're trained to do. That's not their job. Our business office people in our clinics and our imaging centers and hospitals, they're trying to get paid by Medicare. Yeah, They're not really trying to learn what your plan is. So you're very dependent on kind of a siloed um, a siloed system where you have to find uh, hopefully a, a local independent broker that can help you. And that, that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a local independent broker. Or I'm appointed with all the carriers that offer Medicare product and, and our zip code, which is great. This yeah. is a great place to be, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> so we have a lot of people moving in here every, every year. So it's just exploding. Sure. Well, I know that uh, you and I are both in the same BNI group. And uh, we've talked about Medicare and Medicaid, and then I come to you and say, okay, I offer insurance for my employees. What are some of the best ideas on how to do that? And I know Heath has had the same questions. So as Mr. and Mrs. Small Business Owner, what's the first thing you're going to ask us? Well, I I, I do kind of want to ask – you know, is this something that you want to do from a health insurance offering to your employees, something that's going to be recruitment and retention, mm-hmm. if that's mm-hmm. something you want to add? Mm-hmm. And then uh, I would ask something along the lines, so do you want to look at something that's more 
traditional as far as a quote, we can do that. And then um, if that looks like it would be palatable to you and to your employees, we could definitely get a quote pretty in- easily by just getting a census sheet filled out. And then we run the quote, send you uh, kind of the portfolio of plans that are available based on the, uh, the folks that are going to participate. And, uh, you know, right now for small groups, and we, we're talking about small employers, probably less than 50 employees. Yes. Um, we're looking at a Blue Cross, Qual Choice, or United Healthcare plan um, using metallic types of coverages, whether that be bronze, silver, gold. And then we can kind of dive into the nuances of that, depending on how many people are going to participate. Uh, it gets a l- little bit restrictive when you have 10 or less employees actually participating because they can only, everybody can only choose one of the metallics. You know, you're, everybody's on a bronze, everybody's on a silver, everybody's on a gold. But if it's over 10, then there's some flexibility mm-hmm. where people can cafeteria that a little bit. They can say, well, I want gold, I want silver, I want bronze, whatever. So. Well, what if I say I want insurance that um, if they leave us, they still have it? Okay. Well, that um, that gets a little more interesting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so normally, the kind of thing that is working here when you get traditional group with a Um, a prescription drug plan that is considered of standard value, according to the federal government, then the employee's ability to move outside of the group and get insurance is pretty restrictive. So let's just take, for example, we had 10 employees or 15 employees that are on group coverage. You have agreed to pay half of the employee's premium. And that's a, that's a minimum, correct? Yeah, well, yeah. That, okay. You know, so you, but you don't really even have to, if 15 employees, you're not mandated to offer it, to mm-hmm. offer health insurance, but you want to because mm-hmm. you want that benefit. So this person is then on a, on a credible health insurance plan. So they are not el- eligible to go to the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. They can't go to the marketplace of the Affordable Care Act because they're being offered a credible health insurance plan through a group platform. Now, the caveat to that is you're not really, you don't really have to offer the dependents of that employee any premium help, right? Mm -hmm. So most likely, most the spouse or independents or dependents, depending on the marital status of the employee, they're going to pay full price for that that plan. And so under the rules, the federal rules, is what, uh, is what we call the family glitch. And I'm not sure if you've heard of the family glitch, <laughs> but what that, and this, this has recently changed as of, maybe last year, which is better for the dependents, and that is basically this. It it was set up initially through the Affordable Care Act that the family glitch only applied to the premium on the employee. The cost of the premium on the least costly silver plan, and that premium accumulates through the year, and that the aggregate of that premium if it is if it is at or above nine point one two percent, then that person can come off the ACA, and so can their so can their dependents. But that never really quite, kind of worked out because it it can never mm-hmm. reach their heart. Right. Like. So they changed that to where the premium of the dependents, if the premium of the dependents for the least costly silver plan aggregates to at or above 9.21% of the household income, then the dependents can come off to see if there is a better value through the marketplace. So that that came into play. That was a really good thing it, and because otherwise, the only opportunity that the spouse and the dependents had to come off of that group plan was for them to go 
into a plan that had to be underwritten. Yeah. Okay. And when you have to go through underwriting, then the problem is if anybody is taking <laughs> any type of any number of prescription mm-hmm. medicines, that could be a problem. And if they had any type of chronic condition like a cardiac issue, which is chronic, uh, diabetes is chronic. I mean, just any type of respiratory, like asthma, that's chronic, not going to get, not going to go away. If they had something like that, then they most likely were not going to be able to get through the underwriting process. Now, we did have some plans that were very attractive, and they were really considered to be short-term plans, and our two carriers were United Healthcare and Blue Cross. But unfortunately, our somebody in, let's just say, up there thought those were junk plans, and they took had us had those carriers take take those off the market and that just occurred this oh. year okay. and there were quite a few people that were take, taking advantage of, of those plans because those premiums were those plans were built for healthy people mm-hmm. you had to go through underwriting but they were built for healthy people and so the premiums were really low i mean really nice yeah so anyway that's kind of the 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 overview, and 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 I would we would start from just working with a, a group that had uh, you know a number of employees. We're going to see who's going to participate, how they're going to participate, get them the quote, see if it makes sense for the employer and for the employee. Because like you said, you know th- these these premiums are not cheap, even when the employer is paying half for the employee. So, Paul, take you back to the beginning of this. When we started this segment, Mary was asking about small businesses being able to offer these plans to to their employees. Uh, And I I just wanted to highlight how much being able to offer this, it turns that job into a career. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it is. And I think you mentioned that it was, you know, a lot of times utilized for retention of employees, uh, retention, also attraction of new employees. And I I can't agree more with that. I think that is... Mm -hmm. That is the issue that small business are starting to struggle with, in my opinion, uh, someone who's been trying to hire for for some period of time. Health insurance is a big question on those those new hires coming in. Mm-hmm. Do you have health insurance? you know? And uh, for the longest time, I felt like offering a a retirement plan, hey, that's the first step in some retention, some attraction. but we're we're moving into an area where small businesses are forced to, um, to look at plans like this, they better find the you know the best opportunity they can, the lowest price premiums because uh, it's it's something that that our employees are requiring, our potential employees. It's a requirement that they have before they'll even come to work for us. Oh so, no, yeah, I, I just had a um, a client that called me and he had um, basically brought employees on, and, he, and the only way he could bring them on was to offer them something. I'm not really sure because you guys would be able to know better than me, but he had agreed to, you know, pay these new employees about $500 a month um, to be able to get their their health Mm -hmm. insurance. I worked with two of those employees. One of them was able to go to the Affordable Care Act. The other one just got up under the gun and was able to get one of these plans that has since been taken off the market. And that plan is a 36 month plan. So he and his family are going to at least are going to be on that plan for for three years. Okay, who knows? Maybe something would change during the election. Maybe not. Who knows? But that was just an example. Now I don't really have that. I do have. I don't have it yet. But I do have. And you because the question was, what would you do? You know, as far as the mobility of employees being able to get something that's not a group plan. So we just went through a Zoom training last week, and uh, there's a company out of the upper Midwest that's offering product um, that um, is is comparable to the Affordable Care Act. It's really built for employers that have somewhere between 5 to 35 employees. Once you get above there, then the, the pricing just doesn't make a, a ton mm-hmm. of sense. It is an underwritten product. And, but it is a product where it's the reason it can be offered is because it's sitting on a group platform. 
It doesn't necessarily need, mean that it has to be sold as a group plan, but it can be. And uh, they will do a list bill to an employer, but it is actually the individual's plan. Okay. And it's mobile with the individual. Nice. Okay. So we're just in the throes of contracting and getting that, that product, which we just, we were just lucky to, hmm. somebody called us and we were able to get on a call and we looked at it, thought it would be a good, probably a good fit for what we were doing down here. Maybe a good fit, you know, is something I was kind of thinking, oh, I mean, you know, I hadn't met you, Heath, but I met yeah. Mary and I was just kind of thinking, wow, I mean, I, I want to work more with Mary, find some synergy there, you mm-hmm. know, as I'm out talking with groups that, that, that don't have y'all's expertise, being able to move it that way and then work with the employer, having enough people to work with the employer to, to make that happen. Yeah. So we're, we'll certainly share that in the in the Absolutely. coming, in the coming, really in the coming days, not weeks <laughs> or months. So we're hoping to get that on board and contracted here in the next two weeks. Now, Paul, are we still in that area where, like, I remember when the Affordable Care Act first came in. It seemed like, and, I, and this is me speaking, so correct mm-hmm. me if I'm wrong, but I thought it was the Affordable Care Act that pushed us into this. But like every Octoberish or Novemberish, our plans are renewing. It's it's not at the right. first of the year, is that right? Am I right? right? Yeah. And so, so the open enrollment period, open enrollment, the open enrollment period for the Affordable Care Act is from November the first through January the fifteenth. Okay. okay. Now, to get a January first start date on your plan, you have to enroll before December the fifteenth. Okay. So anything after that, so anything from December the sixteenth through January fifteenth, is going to be a February one effective date. So they expanded the enrollment period. It used to go from November 1 through December 30, 31st. Okay. But they gave it two more weeks into the first of the year, which gives people an opportunity. Now, the Affordable Care Act, you know, just, uh, I mean, it's it's an important piece of our health insurance offerings. And it's really from a, it's apolitical. I mean, it's not, I mean, I get it, but it's, the framework of this is very good, even though people are going to gripe about, you know, large deductibles, mm-hmm. usability of the plans. But the way the plans are designed is there is a federal government premium tax credit that's given to the member it clear up to the 400 mm-hmm. percentile of the, of the FPL and below. And then there's a part in the state of Arkansas, which was you got to take your hat off, but, you know, the state of Arkansas was a state that allowed the Affordable Care Act to expand into Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So there are a group of people down there that qualify for either an Arkansas Blue Cross or and better, maybe a qual choice plan. It's zero premiums with very little co-pays and no deductibles covering medicines. And their income levels are really low, but there are a lot of people out there, like an individual, really can't make any more than maybe $20,000 a year gross. But there are a lot of folks out there working Mm -hmm. part-time or people working full-time. They're not really making any more money than that or not working at all. Mm -hmm. And it also works, that plan also works for people who, professionals who may have lost a job during covid I had, uh, I actually put more than one person, but I just, I put a whole family on. It's called AR Home is what it's called. That's the name of the platform, AR Home. It's a Medicaid program, but put them on a Blue Cross and Blue Shield plan because they worked in home health. And when COVID hit, they couldn't work. They were therapists. And so they couldn't go in the home. Mm-hmm. So they lost their income immediately the Medicaid program sees that they have no income for 30 days. That qualified them right there. They didn't have any way to make an income because they couldn't go in the home to do. They were sure, both sure. physical therapists and occupational therapist. So put that whole family on that for zero. And they were stayed on that plan for over two, two and a half years until they went back to work and their income then got mm-hmm. to a level that Medicaid said, well, you're really not eligible right. for this any longer. So it's really, and then when you look at the Affordable Care Act plans, they have functionality. When I'm talking about that is that even though they have a premium and they have a deductible, there are things that you can still 
access without meeting the deductible. Like you can go see a primary care doctor, you can see a specialist, you can go to urgent care, you might be able to get lab work without meeting a deductible, um, you might be able to get therapy without meeting a deductible, but everything else then is deductible mm -hmm. bound and you have to meet that deductible before it goes into your coinsurance um, uh, amounts. And then there's a max out of, out of pocket on coinsurance max out of pockets built into every plan. And you can't be dropped and there's no underwriting. Right. So that that is a, I mean, it, it, sometimes people just complain about it, but it, it, it is really a very good system at this time. Maybe it needs to be tweaked, but you got three right now. We only really still only have three carriers mm -hmm. out there. That would be Blue Cross, Ambetter, and Qual Choice. But Qual Choice and Ambetter are owned by the same company, which is <laughs> Centene. So, <laughs> so the only thing I've really um, with the Affordable Care Act, there is a there's a formula for mm -hmm. calculating mm -hmm. the the premium uh, credit, yeah, or the subsidy, if you will, and if, so from the tax side of this, right, right. Um, I see there's there's a lot of confusion. I have clients that, you know, they're saying, well, I told them how much I was going to make, right or wrong, but uh, they're not. I don't. I think there's a misunderstanding of how important it is to get that that income projection accurate. Uh, you know, if you if you go in and tell somebody, tell them when you're signing up, oh, I'm going to make thirty five thousand. But you get to the end of the year and you've made seventy five, you're paying that that uh, subsidy back, and and that's put people in a you know in a in a bad position. It's partly their fault, uh, but I think part of it is is a misunderstanding of how that calculation comes together and how important it is. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been told that they use a previous year's number uh, rather than than updating. You know, so if. If uh, we're in 24, if my 23 return showed that I made 50000 that's what they're using for my 24 calculation for premium uh, subsidy. And so, anyway, I think that's the only real issue well, I've seen. Well, we have to – that is, they use what they call a modified adjusted gross income. Mm -hmm. And the modified pieces of that rarely come into play. You're it's exactly like, right. I mean, it's like foreign – Foreign earned uh, income. Foreign uh, earned income. So it's really your AGI. Yes. It's really your adjusted gross income. So that is the hardest thing because when we're sitting down with people, the first thing is, okay, so we're going to look at this. Do you know anything about the marketplace? You know, usually it's kind of no. I said, so it's, it's really kind of good because the federal government is going to potentially or possibly give you a premium tax credit mm -hmm. and pay some of your premium, which would be good for you. But what I really need to do is you need to tell me for this year, if we're doing it any time during this year, like if it was right now, I'm going, so for this year, what do you think your your projected income is going to be? And then we have to figure out about what that calc of your AG, uh, your adjusted gross mm -hmm. income, that is on your 1040 form. It's a line item. If you just kind of scroll down there, it looks as AGI. Now, you, I need to know where those income sources are, whether it's from, you know, um, if it's coming from rental property, if it's coming from salary, if it's coming from whatever, mm -hmm. I need to know because in the application, it's going to ask me about the income sources. It's going to say, where did you get this income? Because you're going to have to reconcile that in about two months. Mm -hmm. And that is on you. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't collect that. Right. You're telling me, but that's not on me. That's on you. If you're telling me, this is what your income is, then because you could be filling this out by yourself through healthcare.gov, but I'm assisting you mm -hmm. as a health insurance agent. And so that is a critical piece. Now, if it looks and what you don't want to do is under project. Sure. You know, you don't want to under project because you are going to end up paying for it one way or another. You're going to, if you wait to your tax reconciliation for 2024, next year in 2025, and when that is it, is it a 1095A form? Is 1095A, that that's correct. When that 1095A form shows up and your tax preparer is going, oh, oh wow, look at here. <laughs> uh, that, ooh, yeah, well, you're going to have to pay some of this money yeah. back. And I tell them on the front end, I said, now it's fine. And that's fine. important. Yeah. I say, it's fine to make over what you projected. Just here, you got to call the marketplace. Don't call Blue Cross, mm -hmm. don't call Qual Choice. Don't call and better. They don't have a dog in that hunt. Mm -hmm. They're just the they're just the insurance chassis. 
That's all they are. I mean, they're just administrating administering benefits. That's all they're doing. So you got to call the marketplace and say, hey, it looks like I projected this. But my income is really going to be this. What they're going to do is just jack up your premium based on what you're telling them. And so um, if you can be comfortable with telling me that, then this is going to be a pretty simple yeah. process. The ones that are hard is to just kind of, uh, you know, all over the place. And I've worked with people uh, that were trying to, <laughs> you know, manipulate their their cash flow out of their annuities, working with oh, their yeah. uh, tax, I mean, a tax attorney, trying to get their income at 35, their, you know, their reportable income and still use cash from somewhere else. And I'm going, I really don't care. I honestly don't <laughs> care. <laughs> Just tell me the number and where it comes from. Yeah. Okay, I get it. I mean, I've had to be on the oh, phone yeah. with a tax, with their investment guy. And I'm going, I really don't care. <laughs> I just want to know what that AGI is going to be. <laughs> and you're the tax, you're the tax, you're the CPA, and you should be able to tell him. And I just should be a third wheel out here hanging on the phone. That's right. That's not, that, yeah. Because I don't care. And I'm not going to tell you. All I'm going to say is, they're going to say, well, where's the sweet spot? Okay, here's the sweet spot right here. It's thirty-five thousand. If you guys come up with that, you tell me where every penny of that comes from. I'll put it in the application, and then you guys are going to have to reconcile that. So that's yeah, kind of yeah. where. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's that's the that's usually the anomaly. Uh, the it's very atypical that I'm in the weeds that much, it, and most yeah, of the time yeah. it's just really pretty easy. So. Okay, completely off of that topic, but kind of sort of on that topic. So as an employer, would it behoove me to have my employee go out to the marketplace and see what their rate would be versus what, let's say, I'm paying to Blue Cross Blue Shield today and then reimburse them? Let's just say I pay 100% and reimburse them. Yeah, it could is be. That, is it that, could be cheaper for you, and I think as an employer, you might want to look at that option, even though okay. you can't take advantage. Of it. And that's where you guys come in, because I have no earthly idea how those monies can, how you guys can find a way for the employer to take advantage of what he or she is giving that employer from a stipend yeah, or yeah. whatever allowance or whatever. What and are so, the rules on? Let, let's just say employee A, B, and C, send them out to the marketplace, get their insurance. As an employer, can I pay them the stipend to cover their insurance? So my understanding is that there has to be a um, a third party involved. Or not necessarily a third party, but a, um, a written agreement in place. And I can't think of the term I'm, I'm looking oh, for I, right that's now. That's beyond me. Um, <laughs> It may come to me, Mary. Okay. If it does, so, I'll let you know. Otherwise, okay. I'll so there is that um, you know that is that individual coverage health reimbursement arrangement yes. that sits out there. Yeah. That's a federal program started in 2019. I think uh, Heath, you said you had looked into that a little bit. That's a real interesting little um, program that's not well known. Uh, not is probably underutilized a little bit. Where what, what makes it interesting actually for an employer who is required to meet the mandate, that ICRA will allow them to meet the mandate regardless of whether he has 50 employees and participating or not. That's very attractive to mm -hmm. an employer. Secondly, the individual coverage HRA is um, interesting from the rules for an employer is that an employer can actually discriminate against classes, employee class. He could take his executive team and offer them an employer group plan, traditional employer group plan. He could take his hourly employees and offer them the ICRA. Okay. He could take another group and offer them an ICRA where he has come up with a stipend that actually is better than the premium tax credit for that, for those folks. He could do that. And so, and that is a, that is a, a legitimate tax write-off for the employer. But as you said before, there needs to be a third party, you know, doing all of that setup unless somebody knows how to do the setup. And so the, the, the third party is administering the plan for the employer and they are billing the employer 
a, a certain amount per employees per head per month. But they're keeping that employer in compliance with with the rule. Mm-hmm. So it's an it's interesting. It gives an employer a lot of flexibility. The great thing about that also is for the ICRA or the individual coverage HRA employees, there's no risk for the employer because those plans belong to the employee. So that when the employee leaves employment, they keep their plan. Yeah. They may not keep the premium the premium stipend from right. the employer, but they it looks, um, they can keep their plan. Whether they keep it or not, they can keep the plan. And where I come in on that when I'm working with employees with ICRAs is I am an agent that can help those employees access the Affordable Care Act. I, be- I become their agent of record. I do the application for them through our, we don't use healthcare.gov. We use, we, we, we use Health Sherpa, which is an, um, uh, an approved um, um, electronic platform. And it's so much easier. Otherwise, if I was doing healthcare.gov with you, I'd have to be sitting with you. Okay. I cannot just go in there and log in and create all that stuff for you. I have got to be with you. Gotcha. This, gotcha. they give me permission actually through a cons- consent to actually do the application for them. And so this gives us a little bit of of uh, opportunity. So we've kind of, we, we touched on it a little bit, but I think we kind of uh, went around it some, but the employer can hurt some employees by offering health insurance. If that employee is already on the affordable care act and has a, a lower premium, perhaps mm-hmm. once that employer offers a plan, they're no longer eligible for the Affordable Care Act, correct? And and so some of these things that we're talking about now, the ICRA, yeah, uh, is is another opportunity that those sure. employers have to to make sure because it's one of those things. It's it's a catch twenty two. You get an employer that wants to provide health insurance, but then they because of the the amount they match in premium, they're actually hurting some employees that are that are getting a better amount now. So yeah, it's and so it's it, a, it, when they when they do offer an ICRA to uh, a group, one of their classes, it could be their whole staff, but when it, when they offer it, it creates a special enrollment period in, okay. into the Affordable okay. Care Act. Oh, so okay. they can actually do it at any time during the year. That's not a problem okay. because it creates this SCP or special enrollment period, which allows and on the when we look at the application, as we're going through the application, it says, hey, does it, did this employee receive an HRA? Was this employee a part of an ICRA? It asked those questions in the actual application. I can tell you I've never hit any, either one of those is yes yet. Okay. But I don't do, I don't have a, a ton of focus on ACA, even though I've got a number of clients mm-hmm. on there. So it's kind of, ACA is kind of catch as catch can for me. So Mary, Gosh, I have so many questions. <laughs> I, I know that's <laughs> this is, uh, and I think everyone does, right? <laughs> uh, um, and I won't say the the Affordable Care Act is responsible for this. I think there was, I think there was a ton of insurance questions prior to it that people mm-hmm. didn't know they needed to ask mm-hmm. after Affordable Care Act came into being. What was that? Two thousand twelve, somewhere in there. Eleven. Uh, I think it opened. I think it opened everyone's minds to, hey, we need to be discussing that. But well, the problem with the what we call the the plans that were pre um, pre Affordable Care Act or marketplace mm-hmm. was that there was nothing out there other than an employer group plan that would not kick you off the plan. So even with some of these plans that went away, okay, they're built for healthy people. So you get people on a plan. And somebody decides, <laughs> one of the members or one of the uh, individuals decides to go have a bunch of diagnostic tests run because they want to go see what's wrong with mm-hmm. them. Big mistake on those plans. It was the same way in these plans before. And then all of a sudden, that risk came up. And then the carrier could just send them a letter and go, hey, well, we're going to cover it this time, but uh, this is going to end. Yeah, There's going to be an end date for you. And so that was a problem, and that is, and that was the complaint. And that there was nothing, there was nowhere for individuals who were self-employed, people who were 
you know, uh, very small people who are in between jobs. There was absolutely nothing out there for them. So love it or hate it, the Affordable Care Act what is a good thing. doesn't make any difference who came up with it. It just needs to be made better. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, pretty much everything needs to be made better. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about uh, Medicare. We've we've still got about ten minutes left sure. uh, in the program. Uh, All right. Medicare uh, is a is a big deal as well. A uh, big need. Uh, Mary and I see um, we see a lot of discussion around Medicare, probably as much almost as we do around health insurance. So first, maybe. What's the difference between Medicare, Medicaid? Are they the same? Are they different? What's that difference? Well, they're definitely different. Uh, it, it's basically based on the, those two two things are different in a, uh, because Medicare is federal. So Medicare is Medicare is Medicare across all states okay. and all territories, but not out of the country. <laughs> and then Medicaid is state-based and it's not the same from state to state to state to state. And so and it, what's in, in Arkansas, what's the qualifiers for Medicaid versus Medicare? So Medicare is normally eligibility for Medicare is basically your age. When you turn 65 and either you or your spouse has earned their 40 work credits, as a W-2 employee or as a self-employed person who paid in payroll taxes and, and literally had worked an equivalent of 10 years for at full time, not all consecutive, then you're going to get what we call premium-free Medicare Part A. So that's your hospital coverage and skilled home, skilled nursing and home health and hospice care. And then when you turn 65. You know, you get A, and then you apply for Part B, which is everything outpatient. So really, everything you can think of outpatient, and that has a premium. And that premium changes every year. It probably goes up. This year, it's $174 a month. So that A and B covers 80% of all of your Medicare-allowable inpatient and outpatient care. And so that eligibility is your age, 65 we do have a group of people who are on Social Security disability, and before they became disabled or qualified as disabled, they earned their 40 work credits. So when they uh, establish themselves as disabled, 24 months later, they can be under the age of 65 and get Medicare. So that's okay. that's a this two swaths. Then people on end stage renal disease are automatically qualified. And it, regardless of the age, and uh, a person who has uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotrophic lateral scler sclerosis, which is a progressive neuromuscular disease, usually terminal, those people are all automatically qualified for um, Medicare. So it's very age based, except for our those other three categories out there. And I think you touched on something that Mary and I are constantly fighting with. So we have the the S corporation is a great uh, tax vehicle uh, to to eliminate um, taxes, right? It, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's a great tax strategy. Let's put it that way. And Mary and I are uh, we're constantly uh, you know uh, bringing this up as an option for small business owners, or or we have those S corp owners, and we've got them in a headlock, you know, trying to tell them you've got to take an officer salary. It needs to be. Uh, reasonable. The IRS hasn't defined reasonable, but but reasonable is very important because it not only plays into their future Social Security benefits, but as you just brought up, it plays into their future ability to qualify for Medicare. Uh, if you know if they don't have that forty credits of paying in Social Security, I'm an S corp owner, no salary. That is not self employed income. There's there's no Social Security yep. Medicare being paid and. Yeah. Not only can you hurt yourself, you know, a lot of people like to say, and Mary's heard this as well, well, it won't even be there when I get, you know, get that old. Well, <laughs> yes. maybe it won't, but but if it is, I sure want my piece of it, right? But <laughs> Medicare may be even the bigger piece of this. Uh, Social Security is one thing, but when we get, 
we really have to work until age 65 in order to retire unless we're just extremely wealthy because we need to fill that insurance gap. Yeah, if you don't qualify for it, if you're one of these people, it's just kind of, most people do, but there's just folks out there that just, it could be a female that was married, didn't work out of the home, divorced, husband didn't, didn't, didn't work. I mean, they just, mm-hmm. then they're stuck. And because uh, Medicare premium A, the premium part A is high. It's over $400 a month. So, I mean, you miss that, then you're, you're kind yeah. of screwed. Yeah. So you did ask me about Medicaid. So Medicaid eligibility, eligibility is basically income and resources. That's it. That's what, I mean, it's, it's, they have very, I mean, there are tons of Medicaid program. Uh, there are tons of Medicaid programs under Medicaid out there. And so they're all income resource and some of them have also uh, the functional, functional ability of the applicant, whether they have a cognitive issue or whether they have problems with just you know, taking care of their normal activities of daily living, clear to growth and and developmentally delayed, you know, seriously mm-hmm. compromised physically and mentally. So that plays in a little bit. But most of the time, it's going to be income and resources. Okay. So there is a there is a unique, a couple of unique programs with Medicaid that actually work with Medicare beneficiaries. And what these programs basically do is, it's counterintuitive, it's called a Medicare savings program, but it's administered, just to confuse you even more, (laughs) but it's administered by Arkansas Medicaid. So the application actually goes to DHS. Once it's approved because of income and resources, Social Security goes, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to let Arkansas Medicaid pay your Medicare Part B premium, huge. Because if, you're, if, they're, if they're qualifying, that means that their, in, their gross income per month for an individual is at or below $1,695 a month. Okay. They're trying to live on that. They don't have anything yeah. else, regardless of where that income comes from. It could be from disability. It could be from a little pension that they gained when they were working at one of the plants here. It could, it could have been, but that amount. And then you, they can't have any more than $9,050 of other resources. It doesn't count their house. It doesn't count their personal belongings. And it doesn't count their car. Two cars. The second car is a resource. You know, pigs and chickens and farm animals are resources because they can be turned into cash. You know, savings account, checking account, any type of investments, a cash value long term, uh, a cash value insurance product is a resource because the cash value can be taken out in a loan or paid out in cash. Very rarely do they have any of those things other than a car. Gotcha. And so that pays their Medicare Part B premium, which saves them $2,000 a year. And in some cases, uh, if they become full Medicaid, then it pays their Part B premium, their co-insurances, all their deductibles, and all their co-pays, which can save them thousands of dollars. And it gives them access to other benefits through nice. like like food cards, a food card of $188 to $200 a month, another $2,000 savings a year. They could A person could have a $4,000 increase in real money just like that if they qualify. And that for them, for any of us, four thousand dollars a year is a lot. I don't know anybody in this room who just go, down. yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. But four thousand dollars a year for that group is huge. Is is tears? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Life changing. They're crying. Yeah. yeah, they're going. Oh my god. Yeah. Agreed. And so I have an expertise. I learned how to do those applications because I work in food pantries and mm-hmm. I'm with that group of people in thrift stores and things like that. So to be with that group, you need to know how to do those applications because you can, if they walk down to the Department of Human Services, they're going to say, well, here's sure. Here's this 32 page application. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't tell them, they don't, you know, they don't tell them that they don't have to fill the whole thing out. They don't do it. They won't do it. And so we do it through a portal 
provided by the state of Arkansas, and it's not complex. Yeah. Not well, really. and they, I think that's... And they could, too, <laughs> and it doesn't cost them anything, and it... You know, it it really it, it's it's just fun to help them like that. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. You do spend a lot of time working at the Samaritan Center and other mm-hmm. food pantries to help those in need. It's fun. You know, it's a it's a good group of people that I mean, those volunteers are wonderful. They give everything in food and counseling and dental dental care and. Just get, they're just giving stuff away. They're continuously raising money. So, yeah, the Samaritan Community Center is wonderful. Bread of Life, uh, f- by, uh, that's uh, supported by the United Me- uh, Methodist Church in Springdale. Wonderful. I mean, we have some wonderful organizations here in Northwest Arkansas. And a lot of people, I mean, with this, these two counties are very affluent. You know, you would think they're mm-hmm. very affluent, but we do have a lot of people that, that are struggling out there mm-hmm. trying to live on just their social security. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Mary, I'm going to close this with. Uh-oh. Um, we I think we have without a doubt shown that there is an importance of using someone like Paul if you oh, yes. if you're looking for insurance or or Medicare, Medicaid help. Uh, <laughs> Paul just said it's not complex and I thought what in the world? We've been because talking. I got one of those yeah, thirty-two we, page forms. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not complex for those who understand it, know mm-hmm. it, have have dug into it, and and so I think uh, it's a blessing, Paul. I think you're a blessing to so mm-hmm. many that come in, um, and you talk about others that are that are out there, other uh, organizations that are out there helping people. Um, Paul, I think you're out there helping people. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, it's fine. Uh, so. The Northwest Arkansas area, we're lucky to have people like Paul Livingston mm-hmm. out there, whether he's in nursing, whether he's uh, helping us with our uh, insurance and Medicare and, and opportunities, uh, or whether you're giving us some, some lyrics and some tunes That's for right. music. <laughs> making us exactly. Smile. So, uh, Paul, you're just a, you're a great guy, and it was Thanks. good to have you. It Thanks. Was, it was good Appreciate that. Today. Enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Enjoyed it. Yep, he is a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Nice to meet you here. You as well. Yeah. You as well. Yeah, it's cool. Thank All you. Right. This yeah. was great. Um uh, well, thank you for uh spending time with us and thank you to the Bridge NWA for hosting us. Mm-hmm.